So, on January 1st, 1959, you were born on January 2nd, and he's going to go through every little thing that we did in our lives. And when you turned 13, you saw your first pornographic image. When you turned 15, you lied to your parents about that thing you did. When you turned 18, you did something rebellious. When you were 25, you lied to your spouse. And he's going to go through every little thing that we did. And, and that scares us. That terrifies us to think about that's going to happen on the judgment day. And I'm going to have to sit and listen to my life story. Because I'll tell you what, if you're anything like me, there's a lot of things in my life that I don't want to have to hear again. A lot of events, a lot of mistakes that I would prefer that God not mention on the judgment day. Now, this kind of language compels us to examine ourselves. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Notice in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, briefly here, a phrase that I like that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? And again, what scares a lot of Christians is the idea of failing the test. Even people who have been Christians for a long time, even people who have heard good preaching their entire lives still sit in fear of failing the test on the judgment day. What is God going to say to me? Am I going to be good enough? Am I going to be righteous enough? Did I do enough good deeds? And before we start judging people for talking about works-based salvation, I think look into our own lives. Deep down inside, are you scared of the judgment day? Deep down inside, for as much confidence as you say you have in grace, and as deep as that is, aren't you just a little scared of the judgment day? Aren't you just a little bit scared of failing the test? It's interesting language, isn't it? What is going to be written on my page in that great big book? Am I going to have to face a laundry list of the sins that I've committed? Does it even make sense for me to hear a list of my good deeds when all of my bad deeds have already sullied my moral reputation so badly? What good deed could God possibly talk about on the judgment day? that would make any difference at all in terms of getting me into heaven. Here's another challenge, though. Here's another challenge to think about. How is it that we reconcile the deeds of Revelation 20, the deeds that are in the book, the deeds by which we're judged, how do we reconcile this idea of being judged by our deeds with something like Jeremiah 31, verse 34? That's one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, by the way. One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. Hebrews chapter 8 quotes it at length. But in Jeremiah chapter 31, it says very clearly that God will forgive us of our sins and remember them no more. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. So it says that God will forgive us and remember our sins no more, but Revelation 20 says that there's going to be a gigantic book and I'm going to be judged, ba judged based on the deeds that are written in that book. So either God remembers my sins and takes them into account on the judgment day, or He doesn't remember my sins and therefore doesn't take them into account on the judgment day. Which one is it? That's the scary part about this. Here's my challenge to you, though, before we get any further in this lesson. We keep talking about fear and being afraid of the judgment day and having no confidence and cowering before the might of God. Does that sound anything like 1 John chapter 2, though? Read with me, if you will, in 1 John chapter 2, the last couple verses of that marvelous chapter. In 1 John chapter 2, the writer says very clearly there in verse 28, And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. So are you supposed to approach the judgment day with fear? And he says you're supposed to approach it with great confidence so that when He appears, 
We stand before Him with confidence. Hebrews chapter 10 makes the same point. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39, He says, don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. He says, we are not those who shrink back in shame at His coming. We stand before the throne in boldness. When the judgment day happens, are you going to go, uh-oh, uh-oh, I forgot to clear my browsing history. Or are you going to hear those trumpets going and say, God, I am ready. I have been ready. I have always been ready for this day. Now, does that mean you're perfect? Does that mean that you're arrogant? Does that mean that when the trumpets blast, you're going to be out first in line going like, well, God, what took you so long? You just needed to get heaven ready for me, didn't you? That's not at all what we're talking about, of course. So let's kind of move on to this idea. And I'm moving along with my, my slides here just in case someday they become... No, is Brian shaking his head? No? Okay. Well, I like them. They're nice slides. See? Good slides. We can't avoid the conclusion that our lives are going to be remembered. So however it is that we kind of do this balancing act of deeds remembered versus deeds forgiven and forgotten, however we reconcile that balancing act, we cannot avoid the fact that our deeds from this life will be remembered somehow, taken into account somehow, and that judgment will be based on what we've done in this life. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says it very, very well. As well as I would add John 5, verses 28 and 29, in Jesus' own account of the, the goings-on of the judgment day, John 5, 28 and 29. But I want to notice here, I want to know 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. I love the way uh, that Paul puts it so succinctly here because you can't find a more simple explanation of the judgment day or the basis of the judgment. He says here, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And that's the, that's the throne scene in Revelation 20, isn't it? That's, that's the judgment scene. We're going to stand before that throne. We're going to stand before that judgment seat, and our lives are going to be remembered. Our salvation, which is by grace, is linked with our response to it. How I live makes a difference. How I live means something to God. My choices, good or bad, mean something to Him. I, I always like to think of it as we are not inactive or passive recipients of grace. We're participants in this life. We're participant, participants in the process of determining where we end up. Matthew chapter 25. Jesus talks about those who will be on the right and those who will be on the left, the sheep and the goats. On what basis does Jesus separate those on the right from those on the left? It's because of what you did. Those on the right were charitable. They shared. Those who were hungry, they gave food. Those who were thirsty, they gave something to drink. Those who were naked and cold and tired, they gave shelter and clothing. And the people on the left? Well, on what basis does Jesus deem them to be on the left side? On what basis does Jesus deem them to be goats? Because when they saw those in need, they did not help. You are very much an active participant in the overall outcome of your spiritual life. Jesus never forgets the things that we do, even the very, very small things, even the seemingly menial things, like giving a cup of cold water to drink to somebody in need, like being the voice of concern when somebody is hurt, like weeping when others weep and rejoicing when others rejoice. God sees everything. Now, that might seem kind of scary, but I don't see that as something to be afraid of. I look at Revelation 20 and the great book that's open as motivation. It's motivation to leave a story that God would want to tell. It's motivation to leave a story that I wouldn't mind God recounting. Now, that doesn't mean I believe I'm perfect or that I ever will be perfect based on my own power, my own uh, exertion of moral force. But I want to leave a life behind that when God opens up my page, He's pleased with what He finds. And I don't mind 
that he opens up and reads it. After all, if you've been honest with God about your sins for your entire life, is there really anything new that he's going to read in that book that he didn't already know about? If you have been following 1 John chapter 1, verses 8-10, through 10, of confessing your sins, and he's faithful and righteous to forgive you, when you're honest about sin, there's nothing on the judgment day that God's going to go, Ooh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> we didn't talk about that one there, buddy. How come you didn't let me? Wow! How come you didn't let me know about that one? If you've already been telling God about your sins in the whole way, then on the judgment day, you're going to be like, well, God, you knew that thing I did at 13. You knew about that at 18. You knew what I told my wife. You knew what I told my husband. You knew that about that lie. I've already told you that. There's nothing new to report on the judgment day. If you've been honest with God, then even if there are sins written in that book, even if that book is a laundry list of the bad things you've done, you're still not going to be surprised by what's in there. And neither is God going to be surprised. And again, I don't find that scary. I find that actually quite comforting and motivating to live a certain way like that. You know, but let's kind of delve a little bit deeper into this idea of grace. Because I think, you know, based on our conversation so far, a lot of folks might kind of bristle a little at this. I don't know, Ryan. This idea of your good deeds and your bad deeds and, and, and a list of good things you've done and a list of bad things you've done, which, by the way, I'm not saying that's what actually is in the book. I'm just saying that hypothetically, if that's how you interpret the book of Revelation 20, I don't see an obstacle there to our faith. But again, a lot of people at this point in the lesson will be kind of like, ah, I don't know, this is hard to stomach, right? Especially when you factor in grace. Let me tell you a story. Rebecca knows this story. The Woodalls probably know this story too. I might have done this sermon at, at Wiley a few years ago. Don't tell, don't tell anybody, okay? Heavily altered though, don't worry. It, it's, it's a new sermon, basically. But you all know I'm from Portland. I just said that this morning. If you never realized I'm from Portland, I'm from Portland. And Portland has this great light rail system. It's, it's like Phoenix's, but with uh, you know, a shot of Democrat steroids. And I would take the light rail train to school every single day. Portland State University, commuting back and forth every single day. Went straight to campus. And the thing about it is, you get these tickets, you pay a dollar, and the, the, the ticket lasts for three hours. You ride wherever you want in the rail for three hours. And there was this one time where I went down to school, I had a ticket, lasted three hours, and a class was canceled. So I was, I was just on the cusp of like using this ticket within its three hour time period. I was there for a half a day and I was at, you know, like two hours and 58 minutes. I was like, well, you know, technically if I just get on the train at 2.59, you know, two hours and 59 minutes, well, technically I got on the train with a valid ticket. I just wanted to go home with an invalid ticket. So I got on the train, rationalizing the whole way. I sat there for a few minutes, just thinking about like, what I'm doing is wrong. I know it's a very small thing. It's a dollar ticket. It's a 20 minute ride home. Who's hurt? Right, we do the same things. It's a red light in the middle of the night. Who's hurt? Who am I hurting? Who am I hurting? And yet that's the same rationale that a lot of sinners use. If I just steal from someone who has a lot, who am I really hurting? They've got insurance to cover it anyway. If my wife never finds out, who am I hurting? If she never finds out, nobody was hurt by it. We rationalize sin like that, don't we? It's just a little sin. It's one train ticket. And the more I thought about that stupid little train ticket, the more I thought, in fear, would I want God to come back in judgment right now? now would I want God to come back in judgment and would I want to stand before the judgment seat with that ticket in my hand rather that ticket hiding behind my back would I want that on my conscience facing God on the judgment seat now is God going to send me to hell over one little train ticket I don't know that's God's prerogative 
I can't control what God does on the judgment day. But you know what I can control? Getting off the train, spending a dollar, being honest, and getting a new train ticket. I can control that. So does that mean I'm in and out? Does that mean I'm saved and not saved? And every time I lie or have a lustful thought or, or turn my gaze away or, or, or get greedy or, you know, am I in and out of salvation over and over and over? Can I be saved and not saved like 12 times all day long? Is that what I'm talking about? No. It's talking about accountability, though. It's talking about honesty. Being honest about sin, being honest about you are accountable to God 24 hours a day of everything that you do, both great and small. I'm accountable to Him. And there is a log being made of my life. There is a great big book, symbolically, of course, in Revelation 20, but I try to think of it, there's a great big book with my life's account in it. And when God judges me on the last day, whatever is in that book is going to be the basis for His judgment. And even if it's something as small as a $1 train ticket, I want to be accountable to God and embrace that and accept that and be honest about that. So I got off the train and I bought a new train ticket. And I actually felt a lot better the rest of the day than I would have otherwise. So that leads to this question then. Will my occasional sins keep me from going to heaven? What if I live a generally good Christian life, but occasionally sin? Well, I think the first question you need to ask yourself, if, if that's something you're pondering, is why am I asking that? Am I asking that because I'm trying to justify those occasional sins? Am I asking that because I'm trying to rationalize or convince myself that they're not that serious? That it is just one little train ticket? That it is just one white lie every night? Am I asking that because I'm trying to justify something that I shouldn't? Grace is deep. Grace is unknowable. But the thing about it is, I don't ever want to live the sort of life where I'm constantly looking for the bottom of grace. You know what I mean by that? I don't know what God's limits are. I don't know just how far He's going to let us go when it comes to sin. I don't know how far He's going to let it go when it comes to things we do in ignorance. Things that we do by accident. Uh, sins that we commit when we kind of happenstance or fall our way or trip our way. Into, I don't know. I don't want to find out where the bottom is, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like in a pool. If you don't know how deep the pool is, you don't really want to find out the hard way, do you? Hey, that pool could be 12 feet deep and you could dump, jump in head first. That pool could be 3 feet deep and you could jump in head first. And you will find out either way. I guess I just don't know. I don't want to find out. It's Romans 6, isn't it? Go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. And look what Paul has to say there about this very subject. He says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? I mean, if grace is such a great thing, if grace is such an awesome, boundless, limitless thing, well, why not just continue in sin that grace might abound? Wouldn't that just make God look better? I mean, the more He gets to forgive me, the more merciful He seems, the, the wider His grace appears. Doesn't that just give God extra credit then to forgive someone as bad as me? Well, verse 2 says, May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? If I've died to sin, then I do need to take that $1 train ticket seriously. I don't care if it's just a dollar. If I died to sin, then I do need to take it seriously. And again, it's not my place to judge. Are you and I going to be sent to hell because we occasionally committed a sin? Of course, we're all going to occasionally commit sins. And of course, we all deserve hell. But there are two divergent attitudes that develop. One attitude seeks to test the limits of grace to see what he or she can get away with. The other, in deep gratitude, 
avoids the limits at all costs. Like so many things in life, I think we need to seek balance in our approach to judgment. We need to remember that our judge has precision that goes far beyond human comprehension. I like in Hebrews chapter 4. Go to Hebrews chapter 4 and notice in verses 12 and 13 what it says there of our great judge. In Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, for the word of God, and I will interject there. I know that we typically interpret that to be the Bible, that the Bible is sharper. I I think he's talking more about Jesus. The word of John 1 verse 1, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Because if you read the whole context of Hebrews 4, aside from verse 12, do you interpret anything else in Hebrews 4 to be the Bible? No, we're talking about Jesus the whole way here. For the word of God, Jesus Christ, our ultimate judge, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So how is God going to know the difference between a righteous person who commits sin and a sinner who occasionally commits an act of righteousness. I'm definitely not qualified to make that judgment, but God is. And I'll give you the reason why I believe that to be true. First of all, because God claims to be the ultimate and righteous judge. But second of all, look at the kings in the Old Testament. I love the stories of the kings. To me, you pull out 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, that's a good read on a stormy day right there. But when you read about the lives of the kings of Israel and Judah, what I find very interesting about every single story is that God has a judgment on them, right? When you read their lives, it says, and -and so-and-so became king at this age, and what's the very next verse? And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, or he did good in the sight of the Lord. Read every single one of those king's stories. There is a judgment placed on that king. Uzziah did good in the sight of the Lord. Ahaz did evil in the sight of the Lord. Josiah did good in the sight of the Lord. Ahab did a lot of evil in the sight of the Lord. So what's the difference? Didn't Jehoshaphat commit sins also? Didn't Uzziah commit sins leading to leprosy? Didn't Hezekiah commit sins too? Were any of those kings of Judah perfect people? And did the evil kings of Israel occasionally do some good things also? Ahab had his high points. Every now and then Ahab made the right choice. uh, uh, Excuse me, Jeroboam II wasn't all bad. Jehu obeyed God zealously at times. So what's the difference between the good kings and the bad kings? They all did righteous things sometimes. They all did evil things sometimes. Only God knows. God knows the difference between the good kings and the bad kings. And only He has the authority to judge and say, this man lived a life and he was good. And this man lived a life and he was not. Only he has the authority to make that final assessment. When you look at someone like David, for example, don't you find it kind of hard to believe that David was really that good of a man? <laughs> I like Honestly, if, if, if I introduced you to a man who had an affair, had a guy killed, tried to cover up the whole thing, and a baby died in the process, you'd be like, what? Yeah, what? And I was like, oh, and he was also a polygamist. <laughs> Aside from that, David was a righteous man. Only God can do that. Only God, like Hebrews 4 says, sharper than a two-edged sword. He knows the difference between joint and marrow, between soul and spirit. Judgments that we can't make. Precision that's beyond human capability. And God can do it. 
And God knows the difference. Like I said, He knows the difference between a righteous person who sins and a sinner who can do righteous deeds. Only God can tell that difference. There are some facts pertaining to judgment by way of conclusion that we need to remember. Some balance that we need to keep in mind as we consider judgment. First of all, we need to remember that we're not going to be judged by specific deeds, but by the totality of our lives. Like I said, when you read the story of the kings, guys like Uzziah, he did good things, but he also committed sins occasionally, and yet God still judged him to be a good king. Same with all the other kings. Even the good kings made mistakes. Even the good kings committed sins. The good kings had moments of indecision, moments of doubt. Jehoshaphat, I mean, you think about Jehoshaphat. He allied himself with the household of Ahab and nearly got himself killed in the process. And yet God's overall assessment of Jehoshaphat was that he was a good king who did what was right in the sight of God. Not always, but he was judged based on the totality of his life. The overall assessment. So will God judge me if I try to get away with one train ticket without paying for it? Not necessarily. But that's going to become a part of the whole picture of who I am as a person in his sight. It's one small part of the totality of my life's work in the eyes of God. Second point, I always have a safety valve. Don't forget about that. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8-10. through 10. You have a safety valve that will never run out. If we commit sins, if we're honest about them, and if we confess those sins to God, He is faithful and righteous and will forgive us. And that's inexhaustible. So yeah, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to commit sins. I might even venture to say you're going to commit sins perhaps on a daily basis. But do you take 1 John chapter 1 seriously? That if you commit sins on a daily basis and you confess your sins and repent on a daily basis, do you think God will forgive you on a daily basis? I take 1 John chapter 1 very seriously because if I don't, my friends, I'm hopeless. If I do not have daily forgiveness from God, I might as well just give up now. A third point. I have a truly awesome advocate. When you go to the very next chapter in 1 John chapter 2, it speaks of Jesus as being our advocate before the Father. He is the one voice that is going to come to our defense. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, that if you confess my name before men, I'll confess your name before the Father. So yeah, there's going to be a giant book on the judgment day and that giant book is going to be open and there's going to be a lot of things written in that book and your life is going to be judged based on the deeds in that book but that book is not the only thing standing there before your eyes on the judgment day think of the one who stands next to the book your advocate who speaks for you who defends you before the father who knows your motives your fears and is there as your great comforter. And the last point that I'll make. It's not about where you start, but where you end that matters. You remember what Paul said about himself. In 1 Timothy, let's read a couple verses here by way of conclusion. In the book of 1 Timothy, Paul kind of goes back to who he was when he first started out on his journey of faith. He says in verse 12 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, he goes on to say in verse 15. It deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. It's not about where you start that matters. It's 
where your journey takes you. Everybody comes out of the waters of baptism pretty rough cut. Everybody comes out of the waters of baptism with a lot of things to learn. A lot of things to meld. A lot of mistakes that need to be corrected. Attitudes that need to be adjusted. Knowledge that needs to be learned. It's not about where you start. It's about where you end. Paul was a violent aggressor, a blasphemer, an accuser. And Jesus saw the potential in him to become something more than that. And Paul is going to be judged in his page on that book, not because of who he was before, but because of what he became by the power of Christ. My friends, don't be scared of that book. Don't be scared of what's written in that book. Be excited about the possibility that you have right now the opportunity to add a chapter to your life story in that book. Add the chapter that says you became a Christian. Add the chapter that says all the other stuff that might be written up until now means nothing. Because today, right here, I changed. So whatever need you might have, I encourage you, please, come forward as we stand and sing.